Toys, toys, toys. What a range of choice today's child has. From teddy bears and dolls to monsters from outer space. From guns and rockets to computers and robots. How did we ever grow up without them? We usually think of toys as playthings for children, but today they're the basis of a multi-billion dollar industry. And some people hope, while others fear, toys may be shaping the values, attitudes, even the intellects of tomorrow's adults. Exactly what are toys for? And what are they really teaching our children? Do boys' toys shape aggressive boys? Do girls' toys shape passive girls? Do we expect too much from toys? Must they teach as well as entertain? Ordering is child's play. So is hoarding and construction. Child's play is child's work. Do children play because they are young? Or are they young because they need to play? In technological times, to learn the values as well as the skills of technology. But there's another realm where the toy industry can hardly make a profit. The vast playground of nature, where toys are everywhere. No human factory produces this. We may catch it, study it, play with it, but no mind can fully comprehend this marvelous complexity. Why do we lavish toys on our children? Professor Brian Sutton Smith of the University of Pennsylvania. Most toys are sold at Christmas and for birthdays, so the toy in the adult mind, as part of being something that makes a child happy, is as a gift. In effect, parents says, I give you this toy to bond you to me, now go and play with it by yourself. Now what on earth does that mean? It's a paradox. It sounds as if the parents are cynical. Well, not really. They love the kid. They want to see the kid happy. But on the other hand, in a modern world, a child prospers who is able to play by itself and, uh, and able to work by itself and who's individually capable of concentration and persistence. And toys are about the only things that bring that out. Right from the very beginning, when John Locke created his alphabet blocks, there's always been the hope that children wouldn't waste time just playing. They would do something useful with it, and the useful thing to do with it is to learn something of an educational kind. And that's always been a strain within toys. 1760, the first jigsaw puzzle, educational, like the first baby houses, which taught girls the complexities of household management. For centuries, armies of toy soldiers taught the arts of war while little engineers got started with constructional toys like Meccano. And today, video games, video values. Is this the future adults want for their children? It's an educated elite that hangs on to the past, that hangs on to the idea that it's got to be academic, that condemns the toy makers. We can blame them for the stereotypes, but the stereotypes are there in the minds of parents, in the minds of kids. I'm not trying to excuse the toy makers, they're just a bunch of, you know, entrepreneurs out to make a buck. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Starla. Are you ready, Starla? Yep, I'm ready. Just sing into the microphone, and she sings what you sing in her very own voice. Would you like to swing on a star? Carry moonbeams home in a jar. The New York Toy Fair. 1,600 exhibitors, hordes of buyers. You are looking at big box office, baby, right down to the packaging. The Fisher Price Toy Factory, Medina, New York. The toy industry is a giant, with 60,000 employees and annual sales in North America worth more than $16 billion. That's enough to put nearly 100 toys in the bedroom of the average nine-year-old. Lionel Toy Trains. The macabre reality of Madame Alexander's doll factory. The classics never go out of fashion. This industry tortures its products to make them safe against the assaults of the strongest infants. Today's toys are ready to tackle the problems of the whole world. 
This is the Drug Elimination Force, a combination of drug fighters and villains developed with the help of Partnership for a Drug-Free America. Each of these figures comes with a special battle flash action weapon. It's the message of the DEF that G.I. Joe, the real American hero, does not do drugs, and neither should you. The hottest new sport right now is inline skating. Girls' toys. Skating towards a new feminist world order? Tanya's ready to use a potty like the big kids do. But she's a little bit embarrassed because of the crowd. As you can see, she's blushing. But she'll be fine. Let's just get her seated on the potty chair. And not a moment too soon. Good girl. Let's wipe now with the environmentally friendly reusable toilet tissue. And always remember to flush. For tomorrow's women, this industry is having trouble finding its feet. In the real world of the Toronto Adventure Playground, girls play creatively with whatever comes to hand, cooperating with each other and with boys, and having a lot of fun in the process. In a place like this, you can pick up skills you might never discover at home. You can also learn about yourself and other people. Real play. But with boys, cooperative play can turn into something else. Why do boys love play fighting? Could it have anything to do with the toys we give them? Professor Jerome Kagan, Harvard University. Boys are more aggressive, engage in more rough and tumble play, more force than girls, no matter what culture you are in. So all the toy industry is doing is recognizing that difference and reflecting it in their toys. The fact that toys for boys are aggressive does not produce aggression in boys. Brian Sutton Smith. The process of making belief is what children are doing in play. To believe you can make it in your own fantasies is to believe you'll probably be able to handle these other fantasies, which are what adults call reality. The gunplay by little boys, for example, are running around going bang, bang, bang. They're playing out the realization that men are mainly the ones that get killed. Already by five or six, if you're a little boy, you know that men are heroes and heroes get killed. Is it a wonder then that little boys between the age of six and 12 play again and again and again disasters? They play dying, they play overcoming dying. Play is about overcoming. In order to live well in this world, we have to feel that we have power and that we are immortal, that it's worth doing the things we do and that they will last. Everybody knows that's not true, but you, it doesn't pay to think that, otherwise you give up and you aren't a healthy citizen. Co-author of The War Play Dilemma, psychologist Nancy Carlson Page of Leslie College, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Children used to engage in war play in a way that was healthy for them, a way to work out their understanding about what war is and how people resolve their conflicts, and a way to understand experiences that they were having in the world. That kind of play um, was actually very creative and um, originated by the children who were engaged in it, and uh, different depending on the children who were playing it. Today's junior battlefield is more likely to be found on the TV screen. How does television affect a child's imagination? Diane Levin of Wheelock College, Boston. Starting in around 1984, whole lines of toys were marketed that looked exactly what children had seen on television. With that change, children began to lose control of the war play that they were engaged in. And instead, children all over the world started playing in ways that looked exactly the same to every other child. Because manufacturers and television producers have chosen to mesh violence with empowerment, it has actually confused children and made them think that then in order to get the feeling of empowerment or mastery, they need to hurt other people. If you're the good guy, it's fine to do anything you want to the bad guy. You're all good, the bad guy is all bad. And it's a very rigid limiting model. And that is what children are given over and over and over again. If you talk to kids about television, if you talk to them about toys, you argue about them, you say why you think of this, and they say why they think of that. That kind of stuff leads to intelligent human beings who make wise discriminations in the kinds of world they live in. 
Can watching these pretend monsters really do so much harm? Maybe it's what children miss while they watch TV that hurts most. Making their own toys with whatever comes to hand. Playing alongside girls and boys of different ages and cultures. Arguing, negotiating, cooperating, playing at real life. The second great bogey of the toy industry, gender identity, as modeled by Barbie, the most successful doll of all time. Nancy Carlson Page. Young children are trying to answer for themselves the question of what does it mean to be a girl and mean to be a boy. I know I've been told this label of girl or boy, but what does it mean? And there is the media giving them very strong messages of what it means to be a male and what it means to be a female. For a male, it's strong, powerful, violent, and brutal. He did. For a female, it's passive, and um, there's a very strong focus on appearance. Where do you put the suntan lotion? Parents may be skeptical, but Barbie remains the quintessential girl's toy. Patricia Pape of Mattel Toys. Barbie was first introduced in 1958. She's been incredibly successful over the years. We've sold almost a billion Barbie dolls. There's enough Barbie dolls that if you put them uh, uh, toe to head to toe, um, she could go around the world three and a half times. On average, every little girl owns about six Barbie dolls. Barbie is not intended to be lifelike. She's a fashion doll, and the major play pattern, as we call it, with Barbie is her fashions and dressing her. And her figure is designed to augment the fashions as opposed to say to a little girl, this is what you should aspire to look like. She's been a flight attendant. She's been an astronaut. She's been a lawyer. She's been a doctor. She's had a variety of careers. She has changed as women's roles have changed. The key to the success of Barbie is uh, that we at Mattel, we don't set trends. Uh, we follow trends, so if little girls want Barbie to be um, uh, a, a fighter pilot, then that's what Barbie will be. How's the wedding? It was great. Ken was introduced two years after Barbie, so he's been with Barbie for 31 years. Can I hold him? I don't ever envision Barbie and Ken ever marrying because it's the girl's fantasy that uh, makes Barbie so successful. If the little girl wants Barbie to marry Ken, then she will do that. That's the fun. That's what uh, makes Barbie so successful is because it's what the little girl wants Barbie and Ken to do. Look at Elizabeth's baby. His name is Jeremy. Brian Sutton Smith. We know that boys and girls themselves are the most rigid about these boundaries. And this has a great deal to do with how they relate to each other. And we don't really teach them how to relate to each other in a sexual respect. The most fundamental difference is sexual, which we ignore. I'm not surprised, really, that kids trying to find out what does it mean, you know, to have it or not have it, whatever it is sexually. Um, what does it mean? No wonder they pick these kind of stereotypical things. They want to be sure. They know they're a boy. They know they're a girl. They want to be sure what it is. And all the others are going to jeer at them if they're not what it is. Um, but what it is, we never tell them. These problems don't arise in the vast playground of nature. Here, gender is irrelevant, and manufactured toys can only get in the way of play and exploration. Most toys made for play in nature are miniatures of the machines that men, and a few women, use to mold the earth to their purposes, models of the quest for control that fascinates adults and children alike. Lisa Fawcett of York University in Toronto. Manufactured toys are made by humans, so they have a fixed range of possibilities because our human imaginations only think of so many things. Whereas I think the world of nature is so complex, you can't duplicate that. It offers so many more possibilities than we could dream up. I've never met a child who isn't fascinated by a living thing, which is what you find in nature, living, growing, alive. Things. And especially for a child, I think the fascination is with other species. Something else that's alive, that's the same, it's alive, it breathes, it grows, but it's different. And a child is trying to make meaning about what they are and what they aren't. It's 
when children are anywhere and in nature, why would it be any different when they're hitting something with a stick, when they're pulling something apart? It's part of playing with your hands and learning what they can do, learning about yourself, where you begin and you end, and what this other object is. It's part of learning what's alive and what's not alive. I'm going to try to find some insects. Try and find some insects? Let's pull this piece of bark up and look for your insects underneath. But I found some, but I bashed them all. Can you grab it with your fingers and just pull back? I don't think we know whether children have an inherent set of feelings about nature because we don't spend enough time asking them. We have lots of our own adult theories about it, but I don't think we know. We don't actually ask children when they're hitting a tree, what does that mean to them? We assume it means mastery, it means control, but we don't ask them. It's a nice piece of wood. It's pretty solid. I can see why you like holding it. You grab a dragonfly, say at a pond if you're a little kid, and you, and you look at it. It's one thing to see it, it's another thing if you can capture it and then look at it really closely, let it go, you see it fly, you see shape, motion. And then if you, if you catch it and you pull a wing off and you see that it can't fly, it, it's still part of learning all those things, learning about life and death and movement and all those things that you see in nature and living things. Toys, they're new and shiny and manufactured. That's what we value. We give them as presents. We don't give a walk as a present. When I think of really good naturalists that have formed that bond with nature, I think that in a way it's because it isn't learned out of them. It's not that they learned something special or magical, it just didn't get learned or conditioned out of them. Do girls and boys play in nature and explore it in the same way? Or do they see it with different eyes? Between girls and boys, I do find a difference. I don't think it's an inherent difference or a genetic difference. It might be. I don't believe that. I think it's a socially conditioned difference. When a boy gets bought transformers and toys that you can manipulate, robots, pull apart, play with, then they learn that that's a good thing to do. I don't think the girls are any less capable of doing those things. So what does it take to create a young naturalist? Show them that that is a culturally valid thing, to be enjoying nature, to be curious, to wonder about nature, to like to look at things, to look for the patterns, to ask all the questions, most of them which are still unanswered anyways in science. Give them the space and the time and the experience. And you don't, you don't intervene. You don't need to teach them a lot. If they ask you, you can answer the questions. But to not always be giving them the knowledge we think they need. And, and you, it's good to ask them questions about why they're doing something. Matching the wonder of play in the natural world is a real challenge for the toy industry. It's trying to be environmentally correct, but it's not easy. This is the Cobra's Toxo Lab. It has a double level play set with a pretend command station and also a real working water squirting Toxo gun. It has this working claw arm to grab figures to dump into the hideous Toxo tank. For a baby, anything can be a toy. What can toys teach a baby? Nadia Hall of the Canadian Mothercraft Society. If you watch babies, they're really miniature scientists. And what they're doing is massive trial and error and exploration. And if I do this, what's going to be the response to that? They're constantly starting to sort out the functions and relationships, not only between themselves and objects, but what objects do. What they need. Uh, are things to look at, things to listen to, things to touch, things to put in their mouths. That's where they get all their information from. In a world of small families, parenting centers are ideal places to swap notes on toys, play, and early learning. Mary Gordon of the Toronto Board of Education. In the parenting centers, you have a parent pandemonium. You have maybe as many as 35 children and 20 parents in one room at the same time, and the ages can range from infants to four-year-olds. 
The key feature that I look for in a toy is that it must be open-ended, that there must be many possibilities for play in the toy. The children will combine things and play very creatively. They don't just play with the toy for the purpose that the parent might think the toy was created. With mothers and nannies everywhere, it may not be easy to solve your own problems. It's not easy for adults either. Knowing when to intervene, when to stand back, when to let the child find her own way. The temptation to turn play into education can be irresistible. What's in here? Toys were introduced into the schoolroom in the 1830s by Friedrich Froebel, inventor of the kindergarten. His few simple toys were called gifts. The first gift was a woolen ball. Sticks and rings make pictures from geometric shapes, pictures to illustrate a story. Director of the Froebel Institute in Mississauga, Ontario, Dr. Barbara Corbett. Froebel was very concerned that children, young children particularly, see things as a whole. That's why, of course, they played with the ball, because it's a whole and it's rounded. There's no separation of part. And here the children see the eight parts as one whole. Then they can think about the possibilities of how to use it and how to play with it. Froebel called these activities occupations, with points, the ninth gift, another way of making pictures to tell a story. I did Babe Ruth. He's one of the best baseball players in the whole world. Right now he's going to hit a home run. He's really fat. With older children, Froebel's gifts can explore complex phenomena. Kindergarten blocks create forms of design. Toys in the classroom? What is the role of play in school? These are questions that strike at the very foundations of our definition of education. I think so. Anyway, it's, it's sort of like Brian Sutton Smith. Most parents want toys to teach kids something, but I really think that's absolutely wrong. It's not that you can't learn anything from toys. You do, there's a certain trickle through. But the basic thing about a toy is it's a caricature of reality which enables a child to pretend. He pretends or she pretends so they can feel in control of reality. It's about adjusting to the kind of world we live in. It's not about learning how to get on in school. At the turn of the century, Maria Montessori introduced her method of teaching based on a wide variety of toys she called teaching materials. Director of the High Park Montessori School in Toronto Betsy Gordon. She saw um, little children playing with breadcrumbs on the floor because they had no toys, they had nothing to interest them, nothing interesting to do. And so she gave them concrete materials, things to manipulate, things to move with, things to move about. And at the end of the first couple of years, her children were doing better than normal children in the school system. Africa, Alec, Alec. All those things are better than workbooks and better than teachers lecturing. I mean, they are, they, they, are thing, they, are, they are definitely educational objects, if you wish. Usually what you find is that a child plays with the, what the teacher's purpose is for a while and then starts playing with it in their own way. They take the jigsaws and they make, car, they make towels out of them, you know, things of that order. Um, a child will turn that kind of thing into a toy if it's allowed. You can see the child getting better and better at relating these things and putting these blocks in the right order. And adults like that because it's a measure of success and development. Their academic skills are excellent. They start with language games when they're two and a half years old. Most of them are working with addition, subtraction, multiplication, division by the time they're six. On a concrete level, they're manipulating materials. Work and play in school? Should it be fun? Should it teach basic skills? Should it prepare for life? Surely children need all three if they are to embrace the whole world. The real measure of success and development is the complexity of the child's fantasy in play. To what extent can the child in his play contain the whole of the world with all its enormities and all its disasters? Play in the Holocaust, the little Jewish kids, you know, playing, playing at uh, ovens and burnings and c giving up the clothes of the dead. Why do they do such a thing? They do it because they're living in dire circumstances. 
I mean, what's, you think they're trying to learn about how to do it? No, they're, they're pretending they're in charge of it so that they can feel at least life is worth living when it isn't worth living. That's what the play's about. At the Toronto Waldorf School, natural materials are the only toys. In the kindergarten, slabs of wood, stones and acorns become cakes and pies, transformed in a dream kitchen of the mind. As the mind grows, play matures into science, art, engineering. The perfection of a lion skull, learned by studying the real thing. Can this be a toy? Maybe not. And yet, it's certainly a thing to marvel at, to touch, to study, to show. But there's more to education than learning through objects. Jerome Kagan. If you want to pit the role of teachers, older siblings, parents against toys, <laughs> that's pitting Lilliputians against giants. Very good. At the Mason School, Roxbury, Massachusetts, an experiment. The aim? To bring change using toys and people. To go beyond language and arithmetic to discover the potential of the whole mind. Professor Howard Gardner of Harvard University, author of The Theory of Multiple Intelligence. I speak about bodily kinesthetic intelligence, the capacity to use your whole body, like an athlete, or parts of your body, like a musician or a surgeon, to solve problems or to make things. Spatial intelligence, which is the ability to form a view of the spatial world, the three-dimensional world, and to manipulate it in various ways inside your head. Um, people who have a broad kind of spatial intelligence might be navigators or airplane pilots. Uh, people with more Local kind of spatial knowledge could be architects or painters or sculptors or geometers, that sort of thing. And also musical intelligence. Musical intelligence is just like language. Some people are very good in thinking linguistically and solving problems in language. Other people are very good with music. This is the dinosaur counting game. Toys can teach skills and the essential self-esteem that comes from the joy of learning. It also helps to work with teachers from Harvard, but there's more to the use of toys in school than this. Toys are great. They don't have to cost a lot of money. When I was a kid, I enjoyed playing with words. Now, should we say that wasn't a toy because it's not something you can touch? For me, to play with words, to put them together, to make funny words up was a, a, a place that I got as much flow as if I was playing with an director set. For some other kids, music might be a toy. And for many people, it's playing with other people, playing games with them, tricks, doing things together, fooling them, joking with one another. And as far as I'm concerned, that interpersonal dimension is a toy as well, though we have to call it a psychological toy rather than a physical toy. These boys have made a model of their classroom with the help of an architect, a project that requires cooperation, manual skill, and spatial intelligence. It may also help these boys find a place in their world, a crucial aim of Howard Gardner's Project Spectrum. Okay. You want to do it? We want to present kids with a whole range of objects, toys, and other kinds of experiences to have, which cut across the intelligences, and also expose them to lots of different adults who do lots of different things using different kinds of intelligences. But there's another challenge in Spectrum as well, and that's to help children find what they are good at. There's nothing more wonderful for a person to discover something this is really me. Messy hands I got. If we call her Aunt Jello, what do you think she'd like? Well, I was going to ask you that. Let's see. Lakeisha, Fashion design, with the help of an expert who may not have been inside a classroom since she was a child. What color are you going to use on her face? Black. Ah, like your own skin, dark? Yeah. yeah. Black. Light, 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 black. Light, black. What about, now look at your skin. What color is that? Brown. So do you want to use black on her face or brown? Brown. Many kids like this do not really have a steady kind of relationship with a grown adult whom they can identify with. And in the absence of a mentor, you have at least two strikes against you as a growing human being. So while it's important to find what you're good at, it's also just important to have an older person who put his or her arm around you to hug you and to say, you're good, what you're doing counts, and we can work together to make it even better. 
What if we sing the song that we did today? One, two, three, four. Shake your body down to the ground. Shake your body and dance. Shake your body to the ground. Shake your body and dance. Shake your body up to the ground. Shake your body and dance. The Ontario Science Centre, full of interactive exhibits that teach nothing unless they are treated like toys. Here you must play to learn. First you do, then you observe real science. There's a lot of physics going on here. It looks childish, and so it is. A return to that time when we all learn so much, so fast, so easily, without the help of teachers. This exhibit is called MindWorks. Kids who really want to learn by doing can join the Science Center's Saturday Club. Here they are making robots. It's that fascination with toys that move that has always gripped the human imagination, the power to build machines that seem to possess a bit of life itself. Constructional toys, a powerful force behind our fascination with technology. Brian Sutton Smith. We've been taking children out of a streetwise collective into an individualistic kind of concern with objects which they can maneuver with and manage and so on. That's one of the main meanings of toys, teaching you how to live with objects. It's most obvious in the case of the video games and the computer. Playing video games makes you computer friendly. It's much easier to transfer from one to the other. Parents and teachers, they do show nostalgia for things that they had in the past. They say, what's wrong with a good cardboard box or the pots at the bottom of the drawer? Well, there's nothing wrong with them. Of course, kids like them, but that's not sufficient. The curriculum has to go on for 10 years or so, and we're living in a very complicated world and where everybody's living in the midst of complicated objects. There's no reason why a kid's world shouldn't be full of complicated objects also. Humans are so comfortable with technology, they have used it as a metaphor to explain nature since machines were first invented. This connection between nature and machine has always fascinated Professor Seymour Papert of the Media Lab of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Ways of building give you models for ways of building ideas. And that the way in which a behavior or a product or a shape can emerge in different ways from different kinds of parts gives you models for different ways in which you can put ideas together. Well, you start with Lego. Everybody knows what this is and you can build with it. And then you add some other components. Wheels, everybody knows them. This is a little motor. But here we have some less familiar things. This one is a microphone, also called a sound sensor, like an ear. And these things are little computers, like little pieces of nervous system or a simple brain. So the thing has a behavior. same thing applies to this one. It has two eyes, if you like, photo sensors, light sensors. And these connect again to little logic elements, little pieces of nervous system. And they connect to motors so that depending on how the light shines, one motor goes or the other motor goes. And so the thing is able to steer itself towards the light. Quite small children can use this extra stuff, this enhanced Lego, to create you know, little things that have behavior and even a little bit of intelligence. So I see it as bridging a gap between animals and machines. It's what Norbert Wiener calls cybernetics communication and control in animal and machine. And each one enriches the other by being brought together in the child's mind. Children are very sophisticated about how you go about learning something. 
Seymour Papert has recently turned his attention to video games like Nintendo. What's going on here? Electronic addiction? The numbing of young minds? Or the dawn of a new era of play, learning, and competition? Children are attaching a lot of importance to who can learn first, who can most quickly become master of the latest game. Whether the, and how the content might change, I think this is a big cultural matter and doesn't have anything to do with video games. That is, we, they reflect the culture the children have grown up into and we should look at, look at it as a mirror of the culture and if we can find something to do about our culture, we should do it but not mix it up with video games. And that you don't see enough spirituality in them, well, look around you, they joined the club. The future of toys, of things the children will play with, isn't just the future of toys, it's the future of childhood, and it's the future of our, all our institutions and habits about how we deal with children. We'll have to rethink it all. This is virtuality, the first of a new generation of virtual reality video games created by W Industries of Leicester, England. Don the data glove and video helmet to enter a new virtual world, a player inside the game and in control of it. Sensors in the glove tell the computer exactly where you are in a world seen through tiny TV screens in front of your eyes. Until now, the computer has been master of the video game. With virtual reality, it's a marriage or a duel between human and machine. Don't be distracted by the crudity of this primitive game. With the help of more powerful computers and a lot of human ingenuity, you could be swept from this medieval horror show into the depths of the human body, into outer space, or into history as it might really have been. If this technology grows up, the potential for play and education could be enormous. But so will the potential for escape into a make-believe of dream and nightmare, for flight from the problems of the real world. We know that children are intrigued and indignant about issues of environment and ecology. I can't believe that uh, when we look at the kinds of movies, the kinds of games, the kinds of activities that are offered children so divorced from this, that that cleavage is necessary, that it's somehow rooted in, in what children will respond to. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of how these other issues are built into our culture. At the Hatterian community, Rifton, New York, a culture with values many of us have forgotten, a way of life founded in comradeship, a way that makes a minimal environmental impact, a way that is guided by love of children and by reverence for the earth and for God. Mary and Art Weiser. We think of each child as being a thought of God. And uh, we don't want to get in the way of that thought. I think we all are seeking the childlike spirit. That's our deepest longing, is that we all be children of God and that the children can learn by being with us rather than are molding them. <laughs> as parents, as educators, I let the child grow from the inside. Hatterian children join in the work of the community at a very early age. It's hard to tell where play ends, where work begins. What's a tool? What's a toy? They can be one and the same. Adult skills are acquired early, through apprenticeship, but play does have its place. Toy making is the business of this community. This will become one of their hollow blocks. A room can become a village or Indian camp or whatever. To our amazement, little girls mostly want to play with their dolls in the corner. I remember our daughter, she just carried a little blanket and her doll, and as soon as it was a corner, she had the doll on the blanket or under the table. And our, our sons didn't. <laughs> 
teachers often don't realize how many blocks that children need. They say that children don't play with blocks. It's because they don't have enough. Believe it or not, it is a plastic material. It's like sand, it's like plasticine. You can do such a variety of things with them. How you design these the Hutterians don't reject modern technology. Art Weiser's son Dana and Dan Halleck use computer-aided design for their latest product, Toddler Town. The key to the design is the uh, center posts here, which allow connecting panels in either right angles or straight lines. The Toddler Town prototype, ready for its most important test. Heidi wants to slide the dolly down. Come up the slide, dolly wants to slide. <laughs> After school, another kind of school, a trip to the woods. We're very grateful that we can live in the country. Everywhere there's a sky and there's water and trees. All those things have a deep sort of an effect on a child, I think, that in the end, he can feel a reverence and a feeling of a trust that there is a creator. That, I think, is the most joyful, most challenging area of our work with our children. These probably have not finished laying their eggs. That's why we should be a little careful, not drop them. Who's got the keeper? Here's the keeper. No matter what the way of life, the questions remain. What is a toy? Why do children need toys? Why do we need to play at all? Our children can't tell us. So we, who have forgotten how to be children, must find our own explanations. The beauty of children's spontaneous play should be one of the real joys of parenthood, to be able to sit and watch your child play. What a child will pull out of the air and put into the play experience is a miracle every time it happens. It's sheer creativity. It's absolutely unpredictable. Children who play are finding answers to questions that they haven't even formulated in their minds. They are making sense of the world. There's a sort of a misbelief that the child will be passive and not think if you don't give him some objects. The child's mind works. Remember, the great Greek philosophers probably had very few toys as children. The Arabs who discovered algebra, very few toys as children. Where did all this creative work come from? The mind is generative. My suspicion is that if we ever discovered the stimulating effect of toys on mental development, it would be very, very small. It's the great heresy of this culture that these things have got to prepare people for academic life. Rubbish. They don't prepare you for anything except more play with things. Play prepares you for play. And what's the good of that, you say? Well, because when you have a lot of play, you seem to be a healthier person. Play is a form of adjustment to living in this world. <laughs> 